Next debate, yeah? Yes. Mr. Martin Ducty Hughes to move the motion. Yeah. Yeah. It's very good to see you in the chair, Ms. Doris. I do believe it's the first time I've seen you in the chair of Westminster Hall uh, that I've, seen, I've been participating in a debate where you have actually been the chair. Um, I'm going to introduce this somewhat obscure topic uh, of the role of unincorporated associations in UK electoral funding by, if you'll forgive me, setting the scene. Um, it begins in the Glasgow suburb of Clarkston, the type of place that usually has the prefix leafy attached. And it is composed uh, mainly, as many of members from Scottish constituencies, especially in the West, will know, of that sort of mid-century uh, semi-detached houses which are a familiar sight across the West of Scotland and I'm sure elsewhere. And if you watch Two Doors Down on BBC Scotland, you might know what I'm talking about. In one of these houses lives a seemingly upstanding citizen by the name of Richard Cook, a former vice chair of the Scottish Conservative Party, uh, uh, and also a former candidate for uh, East Renfrewshire as the Scottish Conservative and Unionist candidate. A cursory search of the tons up photos of Mr Cook with numerous Tory grandees, including the current leader of the Conservative and Unionist Party in Scotland, Ruth Davidson MSP, their interim replacement Jackson Carlow, uh, the local MSP. There is also a photo of Mr Cook uh, with the former Prime Minister, the Right Honourable David Cameron, who came to East Renfrewshire to campaign for Mr Cook in 2010 in the election campaign, which of course, as we will all know, made him Prime Minister. Uh, during that uh, campaign, voters in East Renfrewshire were given an impression of a candidate uh, in a Tory target seat who fitted very well into the zeitgeist of the moment, a waste management consultant uh, who could have almost been hand-picked by CCHQ to reflect the new green Tories. Uh, his leaflet spoke about protecting green spaces and improving recycling. Yet incredibly during the campaign, the company which Mr Cook founded, DDR Recycling, was involved in a scam which involved the illegal shipment of waste tyres around the world, as confirmed by the United Kingdom Environment Agency. During the investigations into these shipments, it is then alleged that Mr Cook submitted false evidence to authorities in the United Kingdom and in the Republic of India investigating the case. This case is the loose thread which pulls apart the Scottish Conservative and Unionist candidates carefully managed public persona. Now, thanks to the excellent work of investigative journalists such as Peter Gehan and Adam Ramsey at Open yeah. Democracy, yeah. we have been carefully led through um, a tour, a mystery tour of Mr Cook's business dealings, which belie the conventional suburban milieu from which he came. DDR Recycling is now in liquidation, owing the UK taxpayer £150,000, but not before it had also been embroiled in a Californian court case brought by an international haulage firm which alleged $1.5 million worth of unpaid bills for waste shipments to South Korea. This was only the beginning. Just before leaving DDR in 2014, Cook set up a company called Five Star Management, with 75% of its shares being held by the now late Prince Nawif bin Abdul Aziz the former Saudi Arabian uh, head of Saudi Arabian intelligence and the Saudi Arabian ambassador to the United Kingdom. A third partner, Ms. Doris, is a Danish national by the name of Peter Hustrup, had previously been involved in gun-running scandal in the Republic of India. It is only a glimpse into a dazzling array of international deals, including another $1 billion environmental project in the Republic of Pakistan, which looked to the most trained eyes and observers as a litany of fraudulent deals. So why is this relevant to the debate about unincorporated associations in the political process? <clears throat> I will indeed, uh, yes. For a while, for indeed, he wets his whistle. <laughs> and before he moves on, speaking about journalists and the role that they have played in, in, in exposing the Constitutional Research Council and Mr Cook's activities. Will he acknowledge the role played by Jim Fitzpatrick of the BBC Northern Ireland's documentary series Spotlight, whose marvellous documentary, uh, Dark Money and the DUP, actually 
I think, began this whole investigation and should be commended. And maybe I can remind the Chamber that my honourable friend's name is Brendan O'Hara. Um, I, I certainly totally agree with my honourable friend, the member, for our guile and beauty and commend those who have been assisting in exposing dark money to the light. So let me continue. Um, um, so why is it relevant to unincorporated associations? Mr Cook is the poster boy uh, for the way in which unincorporated associations, UAs, have been used to funnel vast swathes of dark money into our political process. And even worse, the Electoral Commission, the Electoral Commission lets fraudsters like him to effectively mark their own homework. And nevertheless, uh, and in one, just one moment, my honourable friend, the Electoral Commission themselves gave me a very informative briefing ahead of this debate. And I'll use their definition of what is an unincorporated association. UAs are associations of two or more people which do not fall into any of the other categories or permissible donors are carrying on business of other activities wholly or mainly in the UK and have their main offices here. They are permitted to donate money to political parties, non-party campaigners, individuals in elective office such as MPs and referendum campaigners. The key phrase in the definition, Ms Doris, is which do not fall into any other category of permissible donors. And this is what the debate is about today. If the Minister will only answer one question, I hope it would be, be to give all the, I would like to ask why. Given all the ways that individuals and organisations can donate money to political parties and groups in transparent and straightforward manner, do we still allow this backdoor method, which seems to me to easily exploit by, exploited by those who would seek to obscure uh, the province of those funds. My honourable friend. I thank the honourable gentleman for giving way. He's given an excellent speech. Would he be surprised to learn, as I was, and disappointed, that when SNP councillors lodged a motion asking Tory councillors in North Ayrshire to make a statement on dark donations to local Tory um, branches, that the Labour councillors abstained on this motion and does he suspect, like me, that this is not unrelated to the informal conference and supply arrangement, much denied, but which exists between Labour and Tory groups across Scotland? Yeah. Um, it sounds like better together. Um, the case, I think, proves beyond doubt, uh, Ms Doris, uh, is that with incorporated associations, which Richard Cook leads, the Constitutional Research Council, or CRC, he describes the CRC as a group to start promoting the union and all its parts. And whilst based in Scotland, it has critically managed to spread its tentacles across these islands. The CRC is most famous, or should I say infamous, for the £435,000 donation it made to the Democratic Unionist Party during the Brexit referendum. If, <clears throat> not at the moment, no. Uh, no, no, I, I, no, I won't. A vast sum for a party whose normal election expenses don't normally even get past five figures. £280,000 worth of that donation was spent on a wraparound advert in the Metro newspaper in the lead-up to the referendum, the Brexit referendum, despite the fact that the only part of these islands where the Metro is not distributed is the only part in which the DUP itself stands. Now, the bizarre situation, uh, Mr Austin, it's good to see you in the chair, sir. Maybe you will be reminding folks' names if they are allowed an intervention. The bizarre situation, allied with the fact that the advert itself closely resembled the type of advertising promoted in the official Vote Leave campaign, meant that the case soon came to the attention of those investigating illegal uh, collusion between the campaigns, including this Parliament's own DCMS committee. Now, while there are many of... Uh, while there were of why this collusion is not relevant, while there, the, the way or why of this collusion is not relevant to the debate, the vehicle used by the campaigns as a conduit for this cash, the CRC is, because the CRC is an unincorporated association. It could not mask the ultimate sources of these funds. It, I'll, and, and, and I'll let the committee report say it, for it's incredible. Um, now, I won't, no. Um, this committee and the wider public have no way of investigating the source of £435,000 worth of donation to the DUP made on behalf of the CRC and are prevented from even knowing whether it came from an organisation whose membership had, their, had either their sanctioned the donation or not or from a wealthy individual. Um, now, Mr Austin, this is a political donation equivalent to the price, twice the price of an average house in most parts 
of these islands. It's almost 60 times greater than £7,500 threshold for naming political, uh, normal political donors. It, as we know, absolutely nothing about its, uh, its source. And the Electoral Commission cannot tell us, as elected members in this parliament, how they actually verified uh, what was permissible. Uh, I will briefly, yes. I'm extremely grateful to him because sometimes this stuff is actually hiding in plain sight. The Electoral Commission figures released earlier today tell us that the Conservative Party have received a total of £400,000, one donation coming from the household of a former Putin minister eight months Ooh. after the Salisbury poisoning which killed a British citizen, Ooh. and the other one came from a weapons, a weapons dealer and gun runner who's a personal friend of the President of Syria, Bashar al-Assad. Does he agree that if that money is not returned, it confirms the Tory party's status as a complete moral sewer? Yeah. For no, I won't. And I'll make it quite clear, Mr. Austin, I fundamentally agree with my honourable friend, and he, the Minister will not be able to turn to civil servants to answer on behalf of the Conservative Party, because it's purely political. Now, let me also make it quite clear, I'm, this, uh, uh, Mr. Austin, it's the exact opposite of the probity and the good governments that we would expect from a properly functioning Liberal parliamentary democracy. Now, I am sure I'm not the only one when it comes to the con same conclusion of the DCMS committee that the CRC used this myth. Now, let me quote them again. In order to uh, avoid having to disclose the source of the £435,000 donation, the CRC deliberately and knowingly exploited a loophole in the electoral law to funnel money to the Democratic Unionist Party in Northern Ireland. Now, I am, of course, disappointed, not for the first time ever, to see a member of the Democratic Unionist Party at a Westminster Hall debate. But I know, and I know he wants to speak on behalf of the DUP, but I won't, because I wonder how many of them know that the true source of this money actually was, and if indeed, if it did the requisite due diligence before accepting it. Now, why do we continue to let cowboys, let Richard Cook, effectively mark their own homework? Surely there must be a way to ensure the probity of major political donations can be assured. Now, let's not forget that is a legitimate reason for UAs to exist. And it is not my intention, Mr Morris, to suggest otherwise. In a legal sense, it is understandable that certain groups may want to keep structures that have no legal existence. It's separate from, of course, their members. As someone, no, as someone who worked for many years in the third sector in my own constituency, I know very well, maybe they'll listen rather than asking for an intervention they won't get, they'll know very well their value to organisations that do not want to be encumbered by the bureaucracy of statues. Once again, no. Political parties do it, of course, including my own SNP branches, Clyde Bank, Dumbarton and the Mighty Vale of Leaven, so, and make donations to the party, and vice versa. But the point is that they're able to do so in a transparent and accountable yeah. manner. Yeah. Political parties and the subunits therein are already, Mr Austin, as you will know, regulated as accounting units. Anyone going on to look at the list of donors to my political campaigns will know exactly where the money came from. And if it's not from an individual, it can be certain that it's from a group whose aims are well stated and well understood. However, Mr Austin, as we can see from the outcomes of the DCMS report, we know that donors who want to obscure the source of their donations are using unincorporated associations as a vehicle to do it. Quite simply, unincorporated associations beyond regulated political parties are a subtle legal fiction which allows fraudsters to dump dark money into our system and it's not only confined to the outer reaches. It turns out, no, again, no, I won't, at one moment. It turns out that using UAs and similar convenient legal fictions to funnel dark money into our political system is not only the favoured mundus operandi of Richard Cook, but of the Scottish Tory party he used to be the vice chair of. I'll give away to my honourable friend. For giving way. He's making a really powerful speech. He speaks of transparency and accountability being important and of a liberal functioning democracy being something that we should all be, uh, we should all be supporting. But I wonder if he would share my astonishment, because of course electoral support comes in forms other than just hard cash, that the Prime Minister has yet to reply to my letter of the 7th of January about the visit of Aggregate IQ to Downing Street. Uh, and that follows on from her failure to write to me after PMQs, as she said she would, on 
the 12th of September. Uh, oh. Wouldn't it surprise me, because the, the leader of the Scottish Conservative Party has never even responded to my request in terms of a letter about dark money. <laughs> uh, no, I won't at the moment. I'm going to make some progress because I know we are short of time. Because let's be quite open also, because news outlets like Open Democracy and The Ferret have also documented that UAs and similar legal entities designed to obscure donations have been used to flood Scottish politics with cash. During the 2016 Holyrood election campaign, we saw Scottish Tories become the official second party. Hundreds of thousands of pounds were funneled through other organisations with an illegal remit, such as the Irvine Unionist Club, the Scottish Unionist Association Trust, the Scottish Conservative Club, and, of course, Focus on Scotland. Indeed, during the election to this place, we elected, of course, other members from uh, the other parties. Several elected candidates from the Scottish Conservative Party accepted donations from opaque organisations. Quite simply, Mr Austin, I don't think it's befitting for our political system to continue with this type of ambiguity. And I and all my colleagues stood in the manifesto in 2017 to enhance the powers of the Electoral Commission yeah. and increase the punishments available to them, namely... SNP MPs will support new powers for the Electoral Commission, providing them with the legal authority to investigate offences under the Representation of the People's Act 1983. We will also support the Electoral Commission's call to make higher sanctioning powers available to them, increasing the maximum pe penalty from £20,000 no, to £1,500,000. I think we'll all very rapidly, and if, we're not, if it's a debate, maybe a member of the Democratic Unionist Party might have been here, rather than members of the Scottish Conservative Party. No. I think I think we'll also be very rapidly, one moment, I think we'll all very rapidly, if we have not already, Mr Austin, that the current regulations and various pieces of legislation which police our electoral system are being tested to the absolute limit, most certainly at the wrong time. In learning of the activities of the shysters like Richard Cook and our own political process, I was sadly reminded of some of the characters in the recently released book, uh, Moneyland, by the investigative journalist Oliver Bullo. In this book, we see now this unscrupulous and corrupt have used the mechanisms of international finance and regulation to effectively create a place, Moneyland, which puts them outside of the normal jurisdiction that mere mortals like ourselves must live under. One of the most more upsetting aspects of the book is the way in which this city, this, this city, has become the clearinghouse par excellence for both money and reputations of a whole host of unsavoury characters who see the banks, the legal services and a whole range of other civil society bodies and institutions as both ready and willing to help them in that regard. And won't ask, not at the moment, and won't ask too many questions about it. Ultimately, Mr Austin, this is what Richard Cook has done to the CRC. He has used his reputation as a former chair of the Scottish Conservatives, as a former candidate in Rhys Renfrewshire, to create the appearance of probity in the organisation, while at every turn refusing to reveal the ultimate source of its donations or even who constitutes its members. It would be therefore interesting to hear from the Minister if they are happy to see the reputation of their party being used for this purpose. When I have many profound disagreements uh, with the Conservative Party on policy, I understand that in terms of parliamentary democracy, that reputation affects the entirety of our political system. And I cannot, for the life of me, understand why anyone would be happy with those realities. So, Mr Austin, I'm afraid there's no, that this government has now undoubtedly allowed that to happen to our political system, with dark money now flooding underhindered through. Dark money is a cancer on our political system, and unincorporated associations are the most prominent way in which this cancer enters the bloodstream. It is a malignancy that works by removing transparency and confidence in the system of political funding. Yeah. Something which undermines trust in the political system as a whole, no. And we must be, un no, we must be unflinching in our determination to root it out. As Oliver Bullo actually writes near the end of Moneyland, political parties have been guilty of accepting money from sources where they cannot be entirely clear about the ultimate source of those donations. And whether it be the Conservatives, the Democratic Unionist Party, or Vote Leave campaign, they have simply failed to do the, due correct, the correct due diligence. So I draw my remarks to a close, Mr Austin. No, again, to a close with the quote from the book. Disapproval of these superstitious 
payments should not depend on whether they are befitting your own side or not. They are inherently harmful. Without trust, liberal democracy cannot function. So let me recap somewhat and bring together the questions I would like to see the Minister answer today just before I hand over. Given all the ways that individuals and organisations can donate money to political parties and groups in transparent and straightforward manner, do we still allow unincorporated or associations, which are not political parties, to participate so freely, especially in a way which is easily open to exploitation by those who would seek to obscure the province of funds? And will they support our party, the Scottish National Party's manifesto commitment to increase the sanctioning powers available to the Electoral Commission from the current £25,000 to £1,500,000? And finally, Will they finally do the right thing and extend the transparency rules around donations made in Northern Ireland from the cancer of dark money to be removed from our political system? And I call on the entire House to join us in it. Yeah. The question is that this House has considered the role of unincorporated associations in electoral funding. And I'll call the Minister to respond. Thank you very much indeed, <clears throat> Mr Austin, and it's an absolute pleasure to uh, see you uh, in the chair here today. I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for calling this debate and for the contributions made by various members. I'm only amazed that he took no intervention from anyone other than his friends, and I'd be delighted to hear from my Honourable Member for Woking. Um, well, I'm hoping that the Minister uh, will say that the government and all political parties in this place want to root out any wrongdoing. Uh, but I came here today to a Westminster debate... And as the Minister says, I think it's an absolute yeah, disgrace yeah, it's that this sewer of accusations uh, spewed forth from, uh, my honor from the Honourable Member there. He took many interventions from his own party, but refused dozens of interventions from that. This was not a debate. This was a diatribe. And he should be ashamed of himself. Order. Order. Can you clarify that in that last intervention there was actually a question to the Minister, or was that not in fact a diatribe as well? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I think that, oh, order, so far as I can see, nothing disorderly has taken place so far, so the Minister can respond to Mr Lord's question if she wishes. Uh, thank you, Mr Austin. What, what I'm going to do is set out the rules surrounding the involvement of unincorporated uh, associations in electoral funding, which I think will be helpful uh, in responding to uh, this, even, this afternoon's uh, debate. These associations are included in the list of permissible donors set out in section 54 uh, of the Political Parties, Elections and Referendums Act, Referendums Act 2000. Uh, the 2009 six, uh, uh, Additional Political Parties and Elections Act, Mr Austin, then introduced reporting rules for uh, UAs supporting political activities, and these are contained in Schedule 19A uh, of the 2000 uh, Act. Now, Unincorporated associations must notify the Electoral Commission if the political contributions that they make over a calendar year are more than £25,000. This rule applies whether that's a single uh, contribution or several contributions that add up. Uh, an unincorporated association must also notify the Commission of the reportable gifts that it receives in the calendar year before they made the contribution, the calendar year of the contribution, and the calendar year following the contribution. This information is published by the Electoral Commission in their register of unincorporated associations and their register of recordable gifts to unincorporated associations. So in this way, there is transparency in who is providing the funds which are paid out by the associations. No, I won't, for entirely unsurprising reasons. Reportable gifts include a single uh, gift of more than £7,500, two or more gifts over £500, that are given by the same person in the same calendar year, which total together more than 7,500, and any additional gifts of more than 1,500 pounds given by a source that the UA, uh, from which the UA has already received a gift of more than 7,500 in the same calendar year. Now, of course, Electoral Commission guidance, Mr. Austin also uh, states that any UA uh, that intends to make contributions of more than £25,000 should keep records of all of the gifts that they receive that are worth more than £500. There are various ways in which offences are deemed to have been committed. As members are aware, responsibility for regulating political finance sits with the Independent Electoral Commission. So it's right and proper that that should sit with an independent body. Any concerns over breaches of the law should be reported to the appropriate 
uh, authority and a record of the regulated groups who both make and receive donations, which include MS, uh, M MPs and MSPs uh, and other political, politically active people, is publicly available on the Electoral Commission's website. Now, that uh, data, Mr Austin, is a treasure trove of information because it does remind us that in actual fact, the SNP and pro-independence campaigners have accepted political <coughs> donations from unincorporated associations. Who would believe it? I would be delighted to. Thank you very much. Very good of the Minister to give way, and, and unfortunately the Honourable Member wouldn't. But as she was about to say, the Scottish Women's Independence Fund, Trust, an unincorporated association, have donated money to the SNP. But I would just like mm. to ask her opinion of another mm. way of raising finance, which is associated to this, because the SNP so mentioned so sewer. The former First Minister, Alex Salmond, raised £100,000 for a court case, which he... Uh, Subsequently, I have no doubt, may raise more money. But this is a different way of raising money. Would the Minister agree, in that case, perhaps he should give that £100,000 back? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much um, indeed, Mr Austin. And what uh, the Honourable Gentleman reminds us of is that, in fact, actually all parties ought to be able to be entirely above board and transparent about their donations. I can certainly confirm that the Conservative Party is that, and that is how I would expect it to be. Now, the government believes that the rules governing uh, permissible donors and the reporting rules for unincorporated associations specifically are sufficiently comprehensive. The permissible donor rules capture the groups that operate in this area, the relevant reporting rules provide appropriate transparency. They don't, uh, that said, Mr. Austin, swamp these often very small organisations in red tape, which is a consideration in this area. The government has no plans to amend the law, therefore. What I would say is that the 2009 and 2000 legislation introduced greater transparency into this area, and we welcome that, because that means we are able to have this debate today, backed up by a record from the Electoral Commission of who has received what, and that allows us all to be transparent. Now, let me go on to say something on the subject uh, of... Um, uh, transparency in Northern Ireland, uh, Mr Austin, before closing my remarks. I simply, uh, I simply want to say that the anonymity provisions there uh, have an important point from, have an important uh, provenance in history. They were introduced by the Labour government in 2001. Uh, they were based on uh, careful recommendations contained on the fifth, in the fifth report on standards in public life published in 1998 which concluded that it would be unsafe to disclose the names of those who had made don no donations to the Northern Ireland parties, as this may result in their intimidation. So the retrospective removal, Mr Austin, of anonymity could put individual safety at risk, and I think we understand the history from which that rule comes. Now, uh, honourable members will also know that, uh, therefore, the donations and loans regime for political parties in Northern Ireland is different to that uh, in GB. It is a matter for the Secretary of State uh, for Northern Ireland. But thanks to this government, there is now greater transparency, once again, around those donations and loans, uh, because the Electoral Commission now published full details of all donations and loans to NI parties from oh, July 2017. The start date of July 2017 was set as it represented consensus across the Northern Ireland parties, and that is very important. The final point I want to make in this afternoon's debate is this. Donations to the Conservative Party are properly and transparently declared to the Electoral Commission. I think it is unhelpful when members come to this House uh, and make accusations which don't seem to fit with what senior members of their own parties say. And one might note what the Honourable Member for Perth and North Perthshire said on Good Morning Scotland in July 2018. Was there any evidence that the Conservative Party had improperly received donations? No, absolutely not. Now, let's have some consistency. Let's have some consistency and let's have uh, an understanding of what our elections rules do exist to do, the way in which they provide uh, transparency, and that that applies to unincorporated associations as well as to uh, another set, as well as to the correct other range of organisations that are there uh, in our electoral law. I think it is important that we have those uh, rules 
Mr Austin, and I hope what I've done today is set out uh, why we think those rules uh, exist, how they uh, provide transparency to the public, some surprising points perhaps from the records that, that arise from that transparency, uh, and I hope that that is uh, helpful to the House in allowing us all to conduct politics in the respectful manner that we would expect to do so and to display to our constituents. Order.